started reading some English poems, a collection by Penguin Academics. The title is "One Hundred Good Poets of the English Language," collected by Donna Gia. Strange word, am I? Right? So he's a gentleman, but his name, like his、uh, lady's name, you know. <laughs> so anyway, we have a、uh, move on. I talk with the saucer. We're not going to do that. We're going to move on to now in page nineteen actually. And Mom Spencer, I'm going to read the introduction. Then, uh, no one or Elijah come around. I'm going to read on the poems themselves. So, and Mom Spencer, fifteen fifty two to fifteen ninety nine. Was born in London and attended Pembroke Hall in Cambridge. The young man first met royalty in 1579 when he began serving the Earl of Leicester. Le- Leicester, I'm sorry, Leicester. That's what Carl won. He was befriended by the Earl's nephew, Sir Philip Sidney, and became involved in a literary group, the Arabs. Headed by Sidney, Spencer was already at work on what would become his two masterpieces: the Shepherd.、Uh, I'm sorry, the sh- the sh- what? The Shepherd's Calendar is that what it is? Published in 1579, though left unfinished, and the Fairy King, a long <coughs> allegorical poem intended to be an English national epic. Six books were published in 1596. His、uh, Amoretti English, I'm sorry, Amoretti, 1595, ranks among the greatest sonnet sequences in English. In 1580, Spencer, accompanying Arthur Gray, the nephew Lord Deputy for Ireland, to Dublin as his private secretary. Among his most impressive properties, Spencer had been granted Kilcolman Castle, which included three thousand acres. He took up residence there for more than a decade until an Irish rebel burned the castle. In Irish rebels burned the castle in fifteen ninety eight. Soon after, Spencer had been named sheriff of County Cork. It's rumored that he lost a child in the fire, as well as large unpublished session of the fairy queen. The wealthy lady returned to England and died only a few months later. Spencer was greatly revered, and death and buried in Westminster Abbey. That's、uh, again Poe's Corner called the case.、Mm-hmm. Please go on the rolling. <clears throat> This is the rolling wheel from. Amoretti, Sonnet Number Eighteen, by Edmund Spencer. The rolling wheel that runneth often round, the hardest steel and tract of time doth tear, and drizzling drops that often do redound, the firmest flint doth in continuance wear. Yet cannot I, with many a dropping tear. The long entreaty soften her hard heart, that she will once vouchsafe watch safe.、Mm-hmm. I've never heard of that.、Mm-hmm. My plaint to hear, or look with pity on my painful smart.、Mm-hmm. But when I plead, she bids me play my part, and when I weep, she says tears are but water. And when I sigh, she says, "I know the art." <laughs> and when I wail, she turns herself to laughter. So do I weep and wail and plead in vain, whilst she, as steel and flint, doth still remain. So, what this means? What what this make, means to you? This poem impression. Really, I mean, <clears throat> not much to say, huh?、Yeah. I think 
Could he be talking about, um, like a, he's objectifying life, maybe? Yes, he objectifies his, his, his love, a heart of love as a, as a metal or the sword being grinded, you know, by a wheel, you know, so hmm. as a flint, it means, you know, being grinded, continuing being, being cruelly robbed, basically, by this lady, the cold and uh, ridic ridicule, ridicules and, uh, you know, so rejection in the sense. Making sense to you? So, yeah. Anyway, let's move on. So. Well, I think you understand this nature, right? So we're going to move on. Okay, so this is long. We don't have to read everyone. So, okay, let's read the next one. Then, Sir Philip, 1554 to 1586, with a perfect model for poet gentleman, involved deeply in politics, diplomacy, and literature, was born to a noble family in Kent, England, began studies in and Christ Church, Oxford, and to the age of 13, but due to the play left before receiving degree, Sidney traveled extensively in the youth within Germany, Austria, Italy, and Poland. It was named in 1582. He was married the following year to the daughter of Sir Francis Walsingham, after voicing strong support for the English involvement in the wars of the Protestant Dutch against their Spanish ruler, Sidney was sent to the Netherlands as governor for Flushing, a Dutch town that has been given to the Queen as thanks for aid. Fighting beside his uncle, Earl Lancaster, Sidney commanded troops in Flanders. He died from wounds suffered in the battle and for Zutphen, his lifelong friend, put biographer. Falk Greenville claimed that Sidney and heroically lent part his protective honor to another soldier, leaving himself vulnerable. Although his works existing in the manuscript during his lifetime, he was well known as a poet and critic. He is remembered today for his critical works, The Defense of Poems. Fifteen poems, po poesy, so, 1595. His Antrophil and Stella, published post homerously in 1591, were the first great sonnet sequence in England, in English. Okay, let's go on. Go ahead. <clears throat> it says, Loving in truth and fame in verse, my love to show from Astrophil and Stella, sonnet number 31, by Sir Philip Sidney. Loving in truth, and fain in verse, my love to show, that she dear, she might take some pleasure of my pain. Pleasure might cause her read, reading might make her know. Knowledge might pity win, and pity grace obtain. I sought fit words to paint the blackest face of woe, Studying inventions fine, her wits to entertain, Oft turning others' leaves, to see if thence would flow Some fresh and fruitful showers upon my sunburned brain. Mm. But words came halting forth, wanting invention's stay. Invention, nature's child, fled step name, studies flows, and others' feet still seen but strangers in my way. Thus, great with child to speak, and helpless in my throes, biting my trot pin, beating myself for spite. Fool, said my muse to me, mm. look in thy heart and write. How many? <clears throat> it's actually interesting, because when I read poems out loud, I. I'm, I'm using half of my energy to pronounce things right. And yes, it's, like, it's hard for me to understand actually like, really it. Yeah. think about what I'm reading. Okay. Like, I have to look back on it after I finish reading. Okay, let me read, then you ponder. Okay, so. Yeah. Sure. Can you share the poem with, 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 oh, with sure. the larger? So, yeah. okay. 
So it's old English, okay? So this is Sir Philip Sidney, loving in truth. I think in words, my love to show. Loving in truth. I think in words, my love to show. Then he dare, that she dare, she might take some pleasure of my pen. Pleasure might cause her read, reading might make her know. Knowledge might pity win, and pity grace opt him. I saw in fit words upon the blackest face of woe, studying inventions to find her ways to entertain. Or turning others' leaves to see if thence would flow, some fresh fruitful showers upon my sunburned brim. But words came hunting forth, wanting inventions to stay. Invention, nature, child, flesh, dip them, studies blues, and the others' feet still seem but strangers in my way. Thus, great with child to speak. And the helpless in my throes, biting my trumpet, beating myself with spite. Foes said my muse to me, looking the heart all right. Okay. Well, I can see now <clears throat> this is a struggle for him to. I could, the general meaning, I think, is this, is his um, kind of putting in verse his struggle. To capture or find a, a, like almost a sort of creativity or source of expression within himself. Mm. Um, as to some of the particulars, I'm still um, trying mm. to figure mm. those out. But mm -hmm. it's usually the words actually means poem yeah. itself. So yeah. making sense to you. So so he tried to write a poem to his lover. Mm -hmm. Compare himself to others, beautiful poems he found himself for sure. And right, yeah. so he had a lot of love. You know, in truth, means in reality. Mm -hmm. But his words is is a thing. Thing means thing. Words means he don't know the right. And right, so then struggle in the end said, "Hey, my muse, that is, you know, like a, a conscious self." And right, so mm -hmm. Looking the heart, right? Basically, write the heart out. Don't worry about what the other thing is, skills. Are that making right. sense to you? Invention or representing creativity. That's, That's why it so. says off turning others' leaves. So looking at the, mm -hmm. the the results and works of others to yes. see if some inspiration would come upon his own yes. <laughs> struggling soul. Yes. Let's try jump uh, the next one. Time the next one. Have Elijah if he can read for us. Let's see what he can see. If you can read that one, come sleep, go sleep, and certain nights of peace. <clears throat> come sleep, O oh sleep, the certain knot of peace, the baiting place of wit, the balm of woe, the poor man's wealth, the prisoner's release, the indifferent judge between the high and low, with shield of proof. With shield of proof, shield me out of the praise of those fierce darts. Despair at me doth throw. Oh, make in me those civil wars to cease. I will, I will good tribute pay if thou do so. Take thou of me smooth pillows, sweetest bed, a chamber of death to noise and blind to light. A rosy garn garland, garland, and a weary head. And if these things, as being thine by right, move thy heavy grace, thou shalt in me move not thy heavy grace. Thou shalt in me. Good. Livelier than elsewhere, Stella's image see. Ah, oh, you're doing work good, man. Impressive. I'm impressed. <laughs> Okay, now your time to read. You read it again. The same one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we understand. Well, this is old English, really hard to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Well, these are these are actually a lot easier than the other ones we've been reading earlier. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Yes, for the, sure. The guy we had to skip. Yeah, yeah for actually, sure. I studied a poem a lot like this kind of old English in old my English. reading okay. writing program. Oh, okay, good. 
This is Come Sleep, O Sleep, A Certain Knot of Peace from Astrophil and Stella, sonnet number 39. <clears throat> Come sleep, O sleep, the certain knot of peace, the baiting place of wit, the balm of woe, the poor man's health, wealth, the prisoner's release, the indifferent judge between the high and low, with shield of proof, shield me from out the priest. Of those fierce darts, despair at me doth throw. O oh, make in me those civil wars to cease. I will good tribute pay, if thou do so. Take thou of me smooth pillows, sweet as fed, a chamber deaf to noise and blind to light, a rosy garland and a weary head. And if these things, as being thine by right, move not thy heavy grace, thou shalt in me Livelier than elsewhere, Stella's image, see. Mm. So, any comments from two of you about the meaning? <laughs> I just think it's a witty, kind of a witty um, uh, expression of his, <laughs> of his uh, almost slightly philosophical expression of his uh, appreciation for sleep. <laughs> oh. Mm. I really would like to know what he means by, yes, exactly by Stella. I can't figure it out. Stella, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, that's a good point. It might be Stella means some, some godish. I was thinking there. it might be some yeah. mythological reference. Yeah, try it out, search it out. Stella, that's a Greek godish again, I think. Maybe it has something to do with sleep. Image, yeah, means, means image, means peace, am I? So, yeah. Any comments from you? You understand it? Yeah, a little, sort of. I sort of. Kind of what, 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 give give it a summary. Of what do you understand? What this poem is about? I guess thing. just a poetic way of mm -hmm. explaining rest or sleep. Ah, that's <laughs> weird. Stella is a feminine given name of Latin and Italian origin meaning star. So that was kind of obvious, star. but mm. I mean, mm. see starry night like that. So. Evidently, this guy has a lot of turmoil inside. He has a hard time to go to sleep, you know? Yeah. He imagine this is a battle night, which he did. He was uh, involved with battle, am I right? So, mm -hmm. hard to sleep, so he wants to have some, some sleep, you know? So, evidently his castle might be attacked, something like that, you know? So, yeah, this is know. the kind of feeling that he captures a feeling that is often felt when there's some slight presence of depression being felt yeah <clears throat> in the sense that you have these internal even external struggles that you're facing mm -hmm. there's something very sweet and uh particularly attractive um about sleep about sleep yeah during those times <laughs> yeah because you're able to put those things to rest yeah and not have to deal with them almost yes so, so you're talking about the civil war with yin yeah yeah. And from outside the praise, I think that means I was trying to catch him or something. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. So. Yeah. But I like this guy. Eh? So. Mm -hmm. Okay, next guy. I'm going to jump ahead. Okay, yeah. this one too. So, This guy, his name is Christopher Marlowe. Born just two months before Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe, 1564. The 1593, he was a bad boy in for exams and literature. Also, he produced a number of lasting play poems. He died at the young age of 29. Malo was born the son of a shoemaker in Canterbury, England. He attended the college on a scholarship that required him to study for the ministry. When the university threatened to withhold Marlowe's degree for unknown reasons, the Queen's Privy Council intervened on his behalf. Marlowe seems to have, been, have taken part in a secret espionage mission overseas, winning the good graces of the Crown. During the six years between his graduation <coughs> from Cambridge's Shandoy death, Marlowe wrote many successful plays, including Dr. Faustus and the beautiful Malta. He was the writer who first transformed the previously illiterate 
medium of blank verse into a powerful poetic form. He began by a major poem, the Finnish hero in the Leander. He was also busy with a number of criminal activities in those years, including counterfeiting and violating brawls, and were often in trouble with the law. Malo was stunned to death by Ingram Fraser under mysterious circumstances and uh, Deptford Tarvin. There is much speculation as to whether his murder has been set up by someone who wanted Malo dead or was merely the result of a drunken scuffle. Huh, okay, where were colorful lives? <laughs> okay. I Good. think we should skip the first one. Okay. Really okay. And then, I mean, we can. He was called the bad boy for a reason. So then, then let's just move on. Okay. So. <laughs> William Sackter. Hey. I like this guy. From the city four to nine uh, to city city. He was born Strandford Pangabam, one of the eight children of John Shakespeare, Shakespeare, a glove maker and treatment, treatman, Mary Arden, a affluent farmer's daughter, and at age eighteen he married Annie Hathaway, a woman, a woman eighty years his senior and three months is pregnant. The Han three children together following a gap in our historical record referred to as his lost years. Shakespeare moved to London and was already writing plays and acting by 1590. When the theaters were closed in 1593 because of the plague, and the playwright wrote two narrative poems, Venus and Adonis, 1592, and the Rick before Lacris, 1593 to 94, and probably began writing his richly textured sonnets. 154 of his sonnets and 38 plays were has housewived. Shakespeare became a shareholder in the Lord Chamberlain's men, often playing before the court Queen Elizabeth. The company stamped the Globe Theatre. Later reorganized as the Kingsman for King James, James's, James, Shakespeare published his sonnets, though he did not live to see his plays published in 1823. The most performed read works of any playwright in the world, Shakespeare's plays, are staged and adapted for film and television every year. Among them, Richard III, Romeo and Juliet, and.、Uh, Othello.、Hmm. Good. We're going to read all his sonnets. All his poems. So,、mm-hmm. go ahead. When daisies pied and violets blew. This is from Love's Labor Lost. The song and when icicles hang by the wall, delivered by spring and winter respectively, conclude the play. <clears throat> when daisies pied and violets blew, and lady smocks all silver white. Lady smocks, also named cuckoo flowers, and cuckoo buds of yellow hue. hue those are those are buttercups. Do paint the meadows with delight. The cuckoo then on every tree mocks married men, for thus sings he: Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo! O word of fear, because it sounds like cuckold. A man whose wife has deceived him,、oh, <laughs> unpleasing to a married ear. When shepherds pipe on oaten straws, and merry larks are plowmen's clocks, when turtles tread, turtle doves mate, and rooks and daws, and maidens bleach their summer smocks, the cuckoo then on every tree mocks married men, for thus sings he. Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo! A word of fear, unpleasing to a married ear. <laughs> he, he was a pretty goofy guy. <laughs> Terrible. That's in the place. So yeah, then, yeah. So writing something. So, okay, next one. We're going to have Elijah read it. <coughs> When icicles hang by the wall. <laughs> When icicles hang by the wall, and Dick the shepherd's blow his nail. 
and Tom bears logs into the hall, and milk comes frozen home in the pail. When blood is nipped in ways be foul, the nighty, the nighty sings the staring owl. To it, to who? A merry note. Do. <laughs> While greasy John doth kneel the pot. When all aloud the wind doth blow, And coughing drowns the person saw, And birds sit brooding in the snow, Brooding in the snow. And Marion's nose looks red and raw, The roasted crabs hiss in the bowl, The nightly sings the staring owl, To wit to who, a merry note. While greasy, <laughs> while greasy Joanne doth kneel the pot. What the hell? You have knees, man. I can't. Sorry, I don't have enough character like to go with the rhyming because I was. This is like one of the first uh, examples of an impressionistic poem. <laughs> You're just relaying the the idea of an experience almost. Oh. So it's kind of capturing. Uh, a common, I guess, experience is someone in his time during a, a night of winter. Night of winter. Yeah. I, I mean, it seems that way. And it's yeah. obviously from a story. Yeah. This, in this case, from Le Love's Labor's Lost. There's a lot of names here, you know, so. Yeah. Four or five. Okay. Next one. <clears throat> Shall I compare thee? To a summer's day. Oh, I like this one. I can use, you, you can recite this one. So let me yeah. read this one. Okay. I think I read. We're going to read, everyone read this one. This is a beautiful one. Okay. So, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling bars of May as summer's leaves. As all too short the date. Sometimes too hot, the eyes of heaven shines, and often is a golden complexion dimmed. Any we fear from fear sometimes declines, by chance or nature changing course untrimmed. But thine eternal summer shall not fade, no loose possession of them fair thou is. Nor shall death brand thou wanderest in his shade when eternalized to time thou growest. As long as men can breathe, breath, breathe, right? And eyes can see as long, so long, leave this and this give light today. That's beautiful sonnet. So, mm -hmm. you read first. <clears throat> Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? <clears throat> Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling's buds of May, and the summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And very fair, <clears throat> from fair sometimes declines, mm. by chance or nature's charging course, changing course, changing, changing course, mm. un untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou thouest, nor shall death brag thou one thou showest. It's show, showing, showing. In, in his shade. When in eternal lines to time thou growest. So as long as men can breathe or eyes can see. So longs this and gives life to thee. Mm-hmm. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. 
Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaf hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. What this means? Explain. Decoder's poem. I think he's... Going down Decoder's poem. Oh, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I'd have to think on it more, but it's it's like he's he's comparing, even in the very title of the poem, he's comparing a life to that of the summer season, I think. Mm-hmm. And then he's saying, while um, there may, may be, while the weather does change and the seasons shift, mm-hmm. there is yet an eternal summer or almost like an eternal hope for mm-hmm. a life mm. that can be seen... Um, that goes beyond the shade of death. Mm. And I think we read William Weeman a poem like this. So go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah. I, yeah, I can't remember. Mm. Um, Did I interrupt you? No, no, no. Yeah. I, I don't have much thoughts actually myself. But let me tell you. Yeah. The 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 poem, the poem. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, mm-hmm. evidently speaking, the fair lady, okay? We're yeah. beautiful ladies. So. Mm-hmm. But, you know, then, then using summer as a comparison of a badge of the praise, the beauty of this lady, you know, the mm-hmm. fairness is the lady, am I right? So, they're like a bottom base over there, you know, so. Right. And, uh, then, talking about the summer, Gonna pass away, that the beauty are gone. And so is the life transition from time to time, it just cannot stay. But he said, well, there is internal beauty is preserved by this poem. That's the last one. Said, look at this. When in internal lines, that is the verses, right? His poem. To time that grows, so this beauty, rather than diminishing, rather grows, you know. I remember by the, the, the record of this poem of beauty. Making sense to you? As long as men can breathe, that I can see, as long as I live, you see, there will be audience to appreciate it. her beauty through his poem. So, so long live this, which is the poem itself. And this gives light to the like painting, yes. Yeah? So, make it sense here? Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, read it again with understanding us. <clears throat> Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime, too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. Wow. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. That beautiful poem, no? Lazia, read it again. We're all going to read it again. This is one of the best poems in English language. So. <clears throat> Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Though rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's loose hath too short a day. 
Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion, complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometimes declines, by chance or by nature's changing or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair dust. That nor oist, this is the own means possess, am I right? Mm. The oist. Mm. Nor shall death brag thou, thou rest in the his... wanderest, basically wandering, oh. wandering in the shade. Basically. Thou wanderest in his shade. Mm. When in eternal lines, lines to time thou growest, mm -hmm. so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long as this, and this gives life to thee. That's beautiful. I enjoy this, I like this poem very much. Mm -hmm. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough wind do shake the darling bars of May in the summer's village, as all too short a date. Sometime too hard the eyes of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fear from fear sometimes declines by chance of nature changing course untrimmed. But thine eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession and then fear thou lowest. Nor shall death bring thou wondrous in shade when eternal lies to time thou growest. As so long as man can breathe, Oh, eyes can see, so long live this, and this gives light to thee. Wow, that's a beautiful poem there. Mm -hmm. so, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you like yeah. it? Yeah, I like this very agree. much. Yeah. Next one. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes. Sonnet number 29. Mm -hmm. When... In disgrace of fortune and men's eyes, I, all alone, beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, <laughs> futile cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, happily, or luckily, I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising, from sullen earth sing him, sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love, remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. How can they read? You know, just honest. I don't quite understand this one. It's really... This one's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah? Okay. It's easier than the last one. Let, let me read, then you interpret for us. You like it? Can you see? You want to come oh, over here? See? Yes. Okay. When in disgrace with the fortune in the man's eyes, I all alone Beweep my outcast state, and trouble in deaf heaven is my bootless cries. I look upon myself and curse my fate, wishing me like the one more rich in hope, richer like him, like him, with the friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I must enjoy, most enjoy, contented list. Yet in this source, myself almost despising, hatefully think on thee, and they my state. Light to the lark in the break of day arising from a solemn earth, sing hands in the heaven's gate. For thine sweet love remember that such wealth brings, and then I scorn to change my state with the kings. Go ahead, interpret. 
Well, I mean, the meaning is quite simple. It's, but it, it's it's not simple in a way that's not profound in a sense. Sure. But he's sharing his feeling as mm-hmm. a man that's in, or he's describing a, a, a sort of deep-rooted emotion of his. It's kind of like this depressed jealousy almost. Mm-hmm. So he's he's in a he, he's very. I, mean, I guess you could say, to put it simply, he's being kind of hard on himself. Mm. And he, Did he use the word sullen, something like that? He used the word sullen. Sullen. No, um, he didn't. Okay, go ahead. Well, he says mm-hmm. at one point, like the, the the where I got that from is he 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 says like mm-hmm. yet in these thoughts, which is when he says in these thoughts, myself almost despising. He's kind of mm. referring to everything before that that he mm. described mm-hmm. um, of his. Of this envy to the state and ability of other men, he has observed. Mm. Happily, and it's interesting they say luckily, so by chance almost, mm. but in kind of like a poetic way, mm. I think on or think of thee, and his state changes. Mm. So my guess that I, I don't know much about his life, but I, 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 I'd say this is another love poem. Yes, sweet love. Yeah, mm-hmm. like. My, then my state changes to that of like a lark at the break of day, which mm. is like one of the most purest and mm. like initial symbols of joy. Almost. Mm, 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 mm. From sullen earth, seeing hymns at heaven's gate. Mm. So there's this comparison between earth and heaven. Mm-hmm. So he's in a very exalted place in thinking of, I suppose, this person since mm. the love home. Mm-hmm. For thy sweet love, which is the kind of the... The influence of Laura's his, affection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Remember such wealth brings. And so now he's making, he's going to make this comparison with himself and that of the greatest of all men being kings. Mm. He's saying, I wouldn't change my, my state in this <laughs> yeah. place for the, the throne of a king. <laughs> we're really went too far, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting how he expresses himself. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next one. Elijah read for us. And, uh, again, Noah interpreted for us. Are you reading? I'm going to read myself. Which one? When to the sessions of mm-hmm. Sweet Night, though? Shakespeare's poem. I'm going to read out them all. So. Mm. <clears throat> when the seasons of sweet silent thought... When? When the sessions, not seasons. Oh, thought. sessions mm-hmm. of sweet silent thought. Mm-hmm. I summon the remembrance of the things of, pa- of things past. Mm. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with all woes, new wail my dear time's waste. Mm. Then I can draw my eye unused to flow, for precious friends hid in death's dateless night, and weep afresh love's long nice cancelled woe. No, long since cancelled woe. Goodness. Okay. Long since cancelled woe. Well. You're doing pretty good. Impressive, actually. <laughs> this is old English, man. It's hard to understand. So go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And moaneth expanse of many a vanished sight. Expense of many a vanished sight. The, that, that species, the expense, you should have used it because the, the right the poem, sometimes the, the spare one because the sonnet have a certain syllables of uh, pronunciation, you know, mm-hmm. some, some rhythm, you know. So, so they only follow a certain tune, like a piano, you know, like a mm-hmm. piano. Thing. So you have the spare certain ones. The here, the ye disappeared is because they don't want to pronounce it. So it's follow the next vowel as one vowel. So, making sense to you? That's a mm-hmm. standard. Oh, oh, the format for the sonnet. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Look, for example, you have 14 lines. Which count it. Count it. How many lines again? Fourteen? Yeah, there it goes. All 14. All of them are 14 lines. Good. Yeah. And then, can I grieve at the grievances of... At grievances for God? And heavenly from woe to woe, tell o. This means over, am I right? Tell so, over. Mm-hmm. The sad account of forebenoned moan, mm-hmm. which I knew 
pay as if not paid before. For is a, basically before as well, am right? So mm -hmm. happened before. So. Mm -hmm. But if the while I think of on thee, dear friend, all loses are restored in sorrow's end. Okay, let me read. You can ponder on it again. So. When to the session's sweet silence sought, I summon up remembrance of things of past. I sighed like a many a thing I sought. It was all woes new will, my dear times of waste. Then can I draw nigh, unused to flow. For precious friends, it in death the daily snide. And weep afresh, loud, long since cancel woe. And moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I green the grievances foregone, and the heavily from woe to woe tell over. The sand account of a form bemoan the moan, which I knew pay as if not pay before. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored, and the sorrows end. Wow, that's beautiful one. Wow. Go ahead. Comments? Interpretation? I don't even think there's too much to say about this one. It's pretty... Hmm. Like, it's, it's not very... Like, it's a good... It's a good poem. It's... It's not, um... Yes, it doesn't, ask, have, it doesn't let, have any particular... Let me ask you, Elijah, query him a little bit. What do you think he's talking about, Elijah? What's the occasion? Not sure, actually. Hmm. Okay, go ahead, Noah. What is the occasion? Well, he's talking of... Um, I think he's bringing forth his recollection of... Um, a grievous memory, I think. Mm. Both of his... Uh, of incidents within his own life and particularly of people he knew that mm. are no longer alive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I don't know why, but there's this, I'm probably wrong about this, but I feel oh. like when he says the sat, that the sad account of four bemoan moan, which I knew pay as if not paid before. Mm. I, I don't know exactly what that means, but I, I have this interpretation that he's, he's speaking of, Things to come, almost. Hmm. I'm not sure though, because hmm. I don't really know exactly what he means there. Hmm. But he's, I think he's talking about this like underlying inevitability of grievous experience, whether hmm. that be with hmm. uh, episodes in his own life or the, particularly the death of people. Hmm. And then he was mourning remembrance of one particular friend. You know, easy woke definitely miserable mm, yes. feelings or thoughts. And, uh, you know, evidently he's like, you know, I should make up those sorrows as remember him now. You know, so. yeah. But in the midst of sorrows and sadness, he f this is sweet thought came to him. He's, he was thinking he's a friend, you know, and right. the worst at all, basically. Making sense to you? So, mm -hmm. yeah. That's a beautiful thing, beautiful friendship there expressed. So anyway, let's continue. We're going to finish the next one and wrap it up. So. Alright. Oh, how I read this? I want to read that one. Adil, I think. Go ahead. Yeah. This one we just... I like it. Yeah, I think you made a good point actually about the last part. Mm -hmm. Kind of um, pointing to the fact that this was actually written towards or for one person. Because mm. if that wasn't the case, then these last two lines wouldn't make as much sense. I see. So that's yeah. a good point. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not marble, nor the gilded monuments. Mm. Sonnet 116. Not marble, nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme. But you shall shine more bright in these contents than unswept stone. Besmeared with sluttish time, when wasteful war shall statues overturn, and broils root out the work of masonry, 
nor Mars his sword, nor war's quick fire shall burn the living record of your memory. Against death and all oblivious enmity shall you pace forth, your praise shall still find room, even in the eyes of all posterity, that wear this world out to the ending doom. So, till the judgment that yourself arise, you live in this, and dwell in lovers' eyes. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, wow. He's hey. a good writer. I think it's kind of like uh, oh. the one you really like, actually. Which one? Very similar to Shall I Compare These to A Summer's Day. Is that right? And it's... Change the monument, basically. And it's huh? uh, yeah. like preservatory purpose. Okay, I want to read it before you comment. Uh, sure. You know. Okay, Eladia, you want to read it together with me? Okay. Not marble, nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme, but you shall shine more bright in this contents. The unswept stone be smeared with sluggish time, when wistful war shall stand to his overturn. <coughs> <coughs> and the bros roots out the work of a masonry. No Mars is sword, no war's quick fire shall burn. The living record of your memory. Gains them the ob- obverse enmity. Shall you pace force? Your praise shall still find room. Even in the eyes of all posterity. Now where is this, this world? Out of the ending doom. So till the judgment that yourself arise, you live in this and dwell in Laura's eyes. That's indeed, as you said, beautiful and similar. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Come and come and come more. Well, he doesn't give, of course, much detail. Mm. Um, concerning who he's talking about. Mm. Um, like in comparison to the, the similar poem, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, he, he happens to give some... The first one seemed, uh, summer's day seemed to be a, a female lover, right? Yeah. So this one seemed to be a, a war friend or something. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. possibly he does mention him as oh. dwelling in lover's eyes. There were. At the last, last part, part. Okay. yeah. Um, okay. Lowers in those days can be friends as well. Not yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so. um, but yeah, this, this poem itself also seems to be reasonably uh, transparent too. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't seem to have any... A lot of meaning. Uh, well, guessing I mean, not, not okay. that it doesn't have a lot of yeah. meaning, it just Sorry. it's not... Very, word for my part. Yeah. Uh, it's not very um, metaphorical. Well, it is metaphorical. It's just not hiding anything as, mm. as much as others. Okay. Let's see. You live in this and dwell in Laura's eyes. What this means? The poem. Ah, I see. Good. That's why. Okay. Gains death and the obelisk ob- enmity. What that means? So, I guess... Those are two forces, I think, that, um, as he's comparing with other forces as well, mm-hmm. he's identifying these forces that are often the um, destroyers of memory, I think. Mm. So death mm-hmm. is... Um, that's great. Yeah, that's right. Yes. I think all oblivion...